Hi, welcome to Dallas. 84 players started in January. It's four months later, and it's the final eight. It's Dallas, it's the Moody Coliseum, and it's the fifth annual $100,000 World Championship Tennis Finals. I am not going to take time on the podium apologizing for the fact that I can't play this bloody game. More out-of-state spectators than for any sporting event ever in Dallas will see the top eight finishers on the Hager Slack scoreboard do battle for the $50,000 first prize money, the 1975 Cadillac, and the WCT Championship Diamond Ring. Very exhausting. The WCT players traveled 73,000 miles this year. The finalists represent five different countries. Now, spectators from 33 states, five foreign lands, and millions of home television viewers are zeroed in on Dallas to see who will be crowned the 1975 world champion of tennis. Quarterfinal match, it was Mexican Davis Cup star Raul Ramirez, who teamed with Brian Gottfried to win this year's WCT doubles crown against 18-year-old Bjorn Borg of Sweden. It developed into a contest between Ramirez's tantalizing touch game and the uncanny quickness of Borg. Borg survived two set points to force the first set tiebreaker and took the set. He had to break Ramirez at 6-5 in the second set to force another tiebreaker, which he again won. These two come-from-behind wins were too much for Ramirez, who folded under the unrelenting pressure of Borg's game in the final set to lose at love. <laughs> Next, it was Rocket Rod Laver, second on the Hager scoreboard, and the snappy baseline specialist Harold Solomon. Harold's backcourt game is so steady that the other players have said he could hold even with a backboard in a baseline rally. Solomon took the opening set, but Labor crushed him in the following two at 6-1, 6 love. The Never Say Die Solomon struggled back, though, to even the match by winning the fourth set, 6-3. In the end, it was Labor again, as he continued his unbeaten string against the only player in the WCT finals smaller than himself. It was a grueling match for the 36-year-old legs of the rocket, however, as it went well beyond three hours. But the stage was set for the labor Borg confrontation. <laughs> Thursday, 23-year-old John Alexander, who many think will be Australia's next superstar, is playing 23-year-old Roscoe Tanner, the three-time All-American from Stanford with one of the most devastating serves in tennis. But tonight, it was all John Alexander, the man who piled up 610 Hager points to lead the red group this year, showed in very convincing fashion why such greatness is expected of him. Tanner was overpowered, as seldom before in his pro career, 6-3, 6-2, 6-3. After tonight's display, few felt that the semifinal between John Alexander and the winner of the Mark Cox-Arthur Ashe quarterfinal match could be anything short of great. Tonight, Mark Cox almost blew Arthur Ashe off the court before Arthur had a chance to settle down. Arthur woke up to find himself having lost the first set 6-1 and behind three love in the second. But Arthur Ashe was not about to lose in his first match of this year's finals. He'd said going into the year that he felt 1975 would be the year to prove he could be number one. He's always been just one victory away from being considered the very best. He came to Dallas as the top seed by winning the Hager scoreboard competition. But there's just one way to have it be your year in tennis. That's by winning major championships, and the WCT final is this year's first. Arthur Ashe stormed back to close out Mark Cox in four sets. So here are the final four. Bjorn Borg still in the early stages of a spectacular and legend-bound career. 
Rod Laver, for perhaps his final attempt at the only major championship to elude him. Arthur Ashe, determined to prove that he can be the best tennis player in the world. John Alexander, one of the young lions, needing a major championship to put him in the upper echelon. It's the semi-final against Alexander now. And once again, Arthur Ashe has trouble getting untracked. The younger Alexander seems to be in the same top form that had demolished Roscoe Tanner. Both of the murderous sirs of these semi-finalists seem somewhat blunted by the slower surface as there are five service breaks in the first six games. Arthur would comment later that with a slower surface, it's almost impossible to follow a second serve into net successfully. Arthur did little of anything successfully and again loses his opening set. In the second set, Ash settles down, starts breathing in his words, and tears into John with the same slashing, chipping, and driving that had put away Mark Cox in the quarterfinals. We join action in the second set now with Arthur serving ahead 5-1 and 30 love. <laughs> Arthur's now demonstrating the complete game of tennis, serving for the set. When you have it going like this, you have no fear of the delicate touch game that at times gives way to nerves. Don Budge can appreciate more than almost anyone the all-around game of Arthur Ashe. Set three, John serving at three all, love 15. Ashe continues to hit winners. John knows he has to stop Arthur's momentum. Great serve pulls Arthur wide, but still another winner. Arthur's methodical coolness gives him the break and a 4-3 lead. He holds serve easily, and John's now trying to hold on at 3-5, serving a deuce. Keeping cool and letting it happen. 30, 40. Alexander knows he has to do something about the flow of the match, and he must do it now. But as seems to be in his zone, the player's word for hitting that elevated state where you can do no wrong. This continues into the fourth set, where Arthur is serving now at 15 all, ahead 4-2. Arthur doesn't hit his shot deep enough, and John gets a glimmer of hope. 15, 30. Another good passing shot by Alexander, who now has double break point. Shot by Ash, and Alexander breaks with a good passing shot. John and Arthur both hold their next service games, but we come back in with John facing a break at match point for Arthur. beats John Alexander in four sets. He's done what he came to do. He's in the finals, and he's in a position to win his first major championship since winning Forest Hills in 1968 as an amateur. He'll face the winner of the Rod Laver bjorn Borg match, either one of which is a formidable opponent for the man who set his sights on being number one. For Arthur, it's very simple, and there are no uncertain terms. If 1975 is to be the year of Arthur Ashe in the world of tennis, then the place to start is in Dallas, and the time is now. 
Earlier in the week, the world's first 24-karat solid gold tennis ball, worth $33,333, was presented to Arthur by J.M. Hager, founder of Hager Company. Arthur's 760 Hager Slack scoreboard points nosed out Rod Laver's 700 in a contest that went down to the final week of the season. Arthur's consistency in beating out 83 other players for the top spot was an early indication that 1975 would be his year. The Rod Laver Bjorn Borg semifinal provides the Dallas crowd with the most breathtaking tennis since the Laver Rosewall final in 72, which experts refer to as the greatest tennis match ever. Borg is possibly the best 18 year old who ever have played the game, and he's facing maybe the best player in the history of tennis. At 36, Rod is exactly twice Bjorn's age. The fans have never seen such a variety of heart-stopping touch shots mixed with powerful drives down the lines and tricky top spins. The incredible running and retrieving of the young Swede proves a powerful weapon against the shot-making artistry of the rocket. The seesaw first set with a total of eight service breaks saw Borg outlast Laver in the WCT 13-point tiebreaker. Laver storms back to take the second set, 6-3, however, and we pick up action at 6-5 in the third. Borg is serving a deuce. Net cord lifts the ball over Bjorn's racket, and he's facing being down two sets to one to Rod Laver. <laughs> Borg misses an easy put away. Perhaps the bad break in the last point interrupted the youngster's concentration. If it did, it didn't last long. In set four, we find Laver serving to hold off Borg's second consecutive service break. Borg has jumped to a commanding 5-2 lead in this must-win set for him, but falls behind in the next game at 15-30. A great winner by Laver, who goes on to break back. He holds his serve in the next game, and Borg is now serving a deuce, ahead 5-4. Great angle, and Labor can tie the set. possible winner by the incomparable Rocket brings the Dallas crowd to their feet. He's come back from a 2-5 deficit to tie the set and with the momentum in his favor is in a good position to win the match right now. Unshaken though, Borg breaks back and we rejoin action with Bjorn serving for the set at Deuce. Another top spin winner by Rod who needs this point to force the tiebreaker. Labor's done it. If he wins the tiebreaker, he's once again in the finals of the one he has yet to win. The appreciative fans can't get over this match, which has already gone well beyond three hours. Again, Borg, who can become absolutely devastating under pressure, jumps to a commanding 6-2 lead in this all-important tiebreaker. Labor serving with his back to the wall. So after 
After three and a half hours of hard-fought tennis, it all goes down to the fifth and final set. The spectators at Moody Coliseum are wondering if the daring all-out game of young Bjorn will overcome the years of experience behind Rod Laver. The fifth set is all Borg, and we find Laver behind 2-5, just two points from defeat. Out. So with double match point, Bjorn Borg is approaching one of the brightest victories in his astounding career. 15, 40. The pride of Sweden's done it. And on this night, when they both played spectacular tennis, he outlasted the great Rod Laver. For the second year in a row, the teenagers in the finals. He must wonder if Laver will be back next year at 37 to challenge him once again. Bjorn and Arthur offer comments at the WCT Gala Ball the night before the finals. This year, I'm especially pleased to have my mother and father with me. For without them, I wouldn't even be here. <laughs> they have made, made many sacrifices for me, and I hope that my success in tennis has pleased them and justified those sacrifices. Arthur Ashe was the final speaker of the evening. Yeah, after listening to Bjorn Borg uh, give what to date is certainly his best speech, uh, <laughs> and after having uh, been around Bjorn four months, seeing him every day, practicing with him, playing against him, uh, looking at his temperament, I realized that I would make the perfect Nordic, almost. <laughs> Arthur closes the festivities on a more serious note. In the midst of uh, professional tennis's growing pains, uh, WCT also, I think, stands out as for sure the most well-organized of all the tennis promotional groups in the world. And I think that's why uh, you're here tonight, and that's why the WCT finals tomorrow are so well attended. Sunday, and for the third straight time, Arthur Ashe starts off slowly. Bjorn Borg is serving at set point in the opener. Arthur drops the opening set. But what's bothering him is consistently hitting shots into the net instead of deep, which means he's not swinging away. This must change, and he knows it. Second set, Borg's ahead 3-2, serving at love 15. Love 30, and Ash is showing signs of regaining his game. Borg's thinking of his own game, however, and brings it back to Deuce. Cat-like quickness consistently converts apparent winners against him into winners of his own. It's this quality which prompted John Alexander to say of Bjorn, he's so quick that he distorts the speed of the court. Ash hangs on, but Borg wins the next one and again threatens to go ahead 4-2. Arthur chokes another into the net and must know he has to start playing the shots now rather than thinking score. He holds his own serve and it's Borg now at 4-3. The long rallies give Arthur a chance to even out his strokes and develop some rhythm. He knows he can't play Bjorn Borg on the baseline forever, for that's the young Swede's favorite place.
Werther finally forces Bjorn to miss. He knows he can't let up. He needs a break now. But Bjorn doesn't want to let his opponent find his rhythm. They split the next two points, and he's serving at 15.30. Sign of weakness, and Ash can even the set. Borg wins the next point, but it's still break point for Ash at 30.40. That's another, even the set, which Ash goes on to win and evens the match at one set apiece. Set three is even, but Borg breaks in game seven. Ash comes right back, though, and has Borg at break point in game eight. Borg's irritated at blowing a net shot, and Ash goes ahead 5-4 by holding serve in the next game. Borg now serving to even the match once again in set three at love 15. Perfect top spin lob by Ash, but Borg comes right back and is serving now at deuce. Very lucky for Arthur, but disastrous for Bjorn, who's down set point. Arthur can make it 2-1 in sets now. Again in the net, and the teenager is simply not hitting his shots. Arthur breaks immediately in the fourth set and is serving at 2-love. Perfect day. Arthur continues to apply the pressure and is serving now for a three love lead. Another ace, and Ash appears to be again in his zone and untouchable. He takes three more straight points, and Borg is facing a four love situation. Arthur Ashe at this point seems unstoppable. Still another ace, and Ash has his serve perfectly grooved. Two consecutive aces, and Borg is powerless, as would be anyone against this serving. Three consecutive aces, and the crowd senses what's going on inside the quiet man with a mission. Perfect service game. It's a matter of time now for Arthur Ashe. Even Bjorn Borg seems to sense what Arthur's felt, that this was meant to be his time in tennis. Game six, and Borg is serving at love 30. Arthur has won 11 straight points. Twelve straight, and Arthur's first major championship in seven years is almost his. So Arthur Ashe, who thought that 1975 would be his year, has won his first major title. This time, when he put his mind to it, and when it counted, he won.
He overcame first set losses three times, proving what he could do under pressure. By winning the world championship of tennis, he's staked a healthy claim to the number one spot he's worked so hard for. Avid fan, former Texas Governor John Connolly presided over the presentations. I've been a finalist and a winner in many cities and many countries throughout this world. He's carried this responsibility with him wherever he's gone, and he's carried it magnificently well. He's been an ambassador of goodwill, of decency, of poise, of statesmanship for the United States and every country around this world. of the tennis world in being the champion of the world championship of tennis. Mr. Arthur A., will you please come and... This week in Dallas for Arthur, the WCT crown, $50,000 in prize money, the solid gold Hager tennis ball, the 1975 Cadillac, and the world championship of tennis diamond ring.